started. Okay, let me reshare. So now we are on the data scaling page. So can you see this one? And if I flip the slide, then do you see this? So this is a constant. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the feedback. Uh, okay, so here the total chip area is a constant, but the number of transistor becomes x squared. So basically you can have more transistors on this chip. And then next, we are going to derive the delay. How would the delay of the circuit change? So if you recall the lecture uh, 12, not 12, lecture 13, uh, on the delay. So to the first order, the delay of an inverter, for example, is the uh, ZL, that is load capacitance, multiplied by the power supply voltage, VDD, divided by the saturation current, that is the unstate current of the transistor. So this is the, to the first order, the delay. Then we need to look at the individual component here, how would those change, like the C, VDD, and the unstate current. So let's look at the C first. So the capacitance is mostly the gate capacitance. We have other preceding capacitance, like the junction capacitance and so on. But if we only care about the primary capacitance, that is the gate capacitance, gate cap. And the gate cap, you know, you have the COX is this epsilon zero epsilon oxide divided by the thickness of the oxide TOX. TOX is the gate capacitance per unit area. And then we need to multiply by the gate area, that is the W times L. So that is the gate cap of one transistor. And if we think this is a load, then the next generation the epsilon, those are the physical constants, no change, dielectric constants. And then W becomes W over L, uh, sorry, W over X. L becomes L over X. TOX becomes TOX over X. All the dimensions scale by X. That is the assumptions we have before. So here X and X cancel each other. So still you have the X here. So the capacitance decrease by X. Then the unstate uh, current, let's use the saturation current equation. So mu's will be no change, that is the electron mobility. And then the COX here is going to increase, because here we have the COX is epsilon divided by, divided by TOX. So TOX becomes TOX divided by X. Then the COX will become COX times X because TOX is in the denominator. So this X will be flip up. So then the COX will become COX times X. And then the W over L, then W over L will be no change because those two X will answer each other. And then the voltage, our assumption is all the voltage scale by x. So VDD becomes VDD by x, then VTH by x. But then you have the squared here. So here, you in the voltage terms, you will have squared in the denominator. And then you have 1x in the denominator. So eventually, you have 1x here. 
in the denominator. So the power of radius. Then we have those two, and then we can plug into the delay equation. So CL will become CL divided by x, and VDD becomes VDD divided by x. I on becomes I on divided by x. So still you get 1x to the denominator. So the conclusion is the delay reduce by x or like your propagation delay tp becomes tp over x. Then if you talk about the frequency, you know it's like the maximum frequency f max is 1 over 2 tp for one inverter. Then your frequency can become frequency times x. You can run the circuit faster. So this is uh, the indication of the data scaling on the performance. So if you do the scaling, not only you're going to reduce the cost of those transistors, but also the performance of the circuit will increase like the frequency can be higher. And then let's look at the power. This is the active power of the chip. And if you recall from the last lecture 14, for the active power, if we assume the activity factor alpha is like 1, then the power is C VDD square divided by uh, times block frequency. So C from the previous slide, you know, becomes C divided by X. And the VDD is VDD divided by X, but squared. And then clock frequency, as we just uh, mentioned, becomes fast by X. So here you cancel those two, still you have the X squared in the denominator. So this is the power dissipation in a single logic gate, for example, your inverter will be reduced by x squared. But as we mentioned earlier, the number of transistors increase by x squared. Number of transistors increase by x squared. That means the number of logic gates also increase. That number of logic gates also increase by x squared. So here each gate, like each inverter, reduce the power by x squared. But you have more gates, like x squared, more gates. So in total, if you multiply the power per gate and the number of gates, then the total power of the microprocessor chip will be the same. So here you have each gate consumes less power, but you have more gates on the same chip. Then the total power will be the same. This is under assumption that the total chip area, this total chip area is a constant. Or in other words, we want to say the power density is a constant. Power density, by definition, is the total power divided by the area. So here, the total power is a constant. The area, total area, is a constant. So the power density is a constant. Power density is the total power divided by the total chip area. So this is the data scaling rule regarding the power. So any questions?
So let's have a summary here. Here, the standard scaling rule actually is a constant field scaling rule. What constant field? As we discussed, if the device dimensions like T O X A O W scale by this x, the voltage scale by x, then the field, electric field. like this voltage divided by the TOX. This is constant. So if we have this constant uh, field scaling, then we can derive all the following parameters at the single device level and at the chip level. So then I will skip the, some of the details here, but uh, just want to highlight what we have derived from the previous slides. One is this capacitance of a single gate becomes 1 over x, and the current, that is the unstate current from the saturation current equation, becomes 1 over x. And then the delay is the C times voltage VDD divided by I. So then this is becoming 1 over x. This is what we have here. And then the power dissipation per circuit per logic gate is 1 over x squared. This is uh, this one. We have the power dissipation per logic gate or per circuit is 1 over x squared. And the circuit density, that is the number of transistors on the chip, becomes x squared, we have more transistors, the density of the uh, transistor becomes x squared. Then the power density is the total, uh, total power divided by the area that gives you the power density. So those two multiplied together give you the power density, you see it's 1. This is the same conclusion as before, power density. So this is the uh, Dana's scaling rule, and uh, it is actually constant field scaling. So any questions? And next, we are going to uh, generalize this scaling rule to a more generic uh, assumptions here. So still the device dimensions scale by this x and doping density increase and then the voltage also scale. But we are going to introduce a new factor here this alpha to make it more general because previously we assumed the device dimension and the voltage scale simultaneously but if the scaling factor for the device dimension and the voltage are different then we can use this alpha to represent the difference between the device dimension scaling versus the voltage scaling. So here, this is more uh, general, because if the alpha equals to 1, here it goes back to the constant field scaling. Right? If alpha is 1, then this is the same as before. So here is 1 over x, this is 1 over x. So that would be the same as this one. That is a constant field scaling. If alpha becomes 1, that is a special case. But in general, you can have alpha to be other numbers. And another special case is uh, when the alpha equals to x. If you see here, if alpha equals to x, 
then is this alpha over x will become one. That means the voltage does not scale. Voltage keeps the same. So this is another special case as the constant voltage scaling if alpha equals to x. And if alpha equals to 1, then this is a special case for the constant field scaling. And then if alpha is any other number, then it's just a more general case. Okay, so if you have this uh, alpha for the general case, then we can derive the same parameters as follows. I will skip the uh, derivation, but I just want to highlight the conclusions here. For example, the capacitance is still 1 over x. So the capacitance, if you follow the same practice here, we do the capacitance. Because this capacitance only depends on the dimension, like those W, L, Q, X. So it only has X there. So you can reach the same conclusion. It will reduce by X. But the, it will reduce by X. But the current, okay, here, will be different. Because if you derive for the current, you need to carry the voltage into the current equation. Let's go back. In the current equation, for example here, you have the saturation current. Now you have to plug in the voltage. It's no longer VDD divided by X. You need to carry that alpha. So it will be alpha VDD divided by X. So you have the alpha squared eventually. So here I will not uh, 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 go into the details of the derivation, but you can do that. The basic rule is that you carry the alpha. So basically you change the VDD to be alpha VDD divided by X. So if you do that, then you will have that alpha square into the current equation here. And then with this capacitance and then the current, then again you can go to the uh, delay, which is the C times the VDD divided by the current. And then you plug in this capacitance and the current, those factors, and then VDD. You need to use this R, carry this R alpha. Then if you, you do that, then you get this 1 over alpha x for the circuit delay. And then for the power dissipation, you will get this one. The reason is similar as before. For the power dissipation, you need to plug in this uh, CVDD square times F. Then you need to carry the alpha into the CVDD VDD square. And then for the F, the clock frequency will also increase. But you have the alpha in the F as well. So eventually, you will get this alpha cube divided by x squared. Uh, but the circuit density, that means the number of transistors on the same chip area, will increase by x squared. Then again, the power density is the power multiplied by the circuit density, or the power divided by the area. That will give you this power density. So if you do that, then here you will get the power density. This x squared cancelled. It will be alpha q. So we can verify that if the alpha is 1, that is constant field. So here this alpha q will be 1. This is the same as before here. Because this alpha equals to 1 is just a special case in this general scaling. And alpha equals to x is another special case.
that is constant voltage. So any questions on the table here? Okay, so to summarize, uh, we have two special cases. One is constant field, and that is proposed originally by the Dennard. And then we have another one, is the constant voltage. And then in between, we will have this generalized scaling with arbitrary alpha here. And then you can use those conclusions to look at how those uh, parameters would change if you scale. So the power density will increase if we follow the constant voltage scaling. So this is an important conclusion you want to keep in mind. So if you don't scale voltage and dimension proportion to each other, then the power density will increase. Okay, so let's look at the scaling in practice. This is how the industry has been done in the past few decades from micrometer scale to 32 nanometer scale, which is about 10 years ago. So here, this is the VDD, and this is the TOX. So the oxide field, electric field, is this VDD divided by TOX. So here are some practical numbers that the industry has been used. So in the very old technology node, like 30 years, 40 years ago, at 2 micrometer scale, then the power supply is 5 volts. Uh, but in the following several generations, then the power supply is a constant. So this means what? This means it's a constant voltage scaling, right? This is constant voltage scaling. That means this alpha equals to x. But the TOX keep decreasing. Therefore, the field increasing. Right. So here, so here, increase from 1.4 megavolt per centimeter to 2.8 megavolts per centimeter. The reason that the industry didn't scale the power supply uh, from he, uh, those generations is because at that time, it will be easier to maintain the power supply for different generations of the chips because simply because they want to make it compatible to the circuit board or for, uh, let's say, for compatibility with other instruments. So if you keep the design, because the power supply is like the, uh, the, 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 the interface, right? To other like the the power network, if you keep the power supply the same, then it will be easier for the design because you need to if the power supply keep changing, then the power converter every time you need to redesign that because for those all the chips uh, is operating on the DC DC power supply, then on all the circuit board there is a power converter to convert our AC from the outlet from your wall. For example, you have 110 volt AC power. You need to convert that to the DC and power supply, VDD. So if you make the power supply the same, it will be easier for different chips to be compatible with the same circuit board. Uh, so this is a, a constant uh, voltage scaling. But uh, after that, then you see that both the voltage scale and the TOX scale, uh, they are not in proportion to each other. So this is more like a general general scaling. And uh, alpha not exactly the same as X. 
but in the recent technology loads here, then this is more like the constant field. Then alpha is more like one. So here is more like proportional the voltage and the oxide thickness. As a result, the field in the oxide is about 10 megavolts, about 10 megavolts per centimeter. It's more like a constant here. So this is a limit, the constant field, because more than 10 megavolt per centimeter, the gate oxide if you use silicon dioxide, it will break down. Break down means the, the short circuit from your gate to channel. Then it's no longer insulator uh, there. So then your device basically is damaged. The reason is that this is a maximum electric field before the oxide breaks down. So you have to maintain that. So then this is a constant field scaling in this case. So any questions? And then we need to keep in mind those assumptions in the scaling rule are very ideal. But the not everything is perfect. Something does not actually scale. So let's look at some of the parameters that don't scale straightly. For example, the gate oxide thickness, the TOX. So the TOX no longer scale these days. So this is a historical trend from different technology nodes. And uh, the TOX uh, used to scale, but then below like 90 nanometer load, then it's no longer scale. It's about like one or two nanometer. This is because once you scale the TOX to below two nanometer dimension, then it's so thin that the quantum mechanics will they a row here. The gate current or the leakage of the gate current will exponentially increase. So here on the right hand side we show the gate leakage current exponentially increase. That means the gate is no longer insulator. Then you cannot uh, scale the TOX. Actually TOX is already very thin. If you think about 2 nanometer, as you recall, the atomic distance between two atoms is typically 0.5 nanometer. So if you have less than 2 nanometer, then you only have 2 or 3 atoms between the gate metal to the channel. Then your oxide is only like 2 or 3 atoms there. So you cannot scale further. So TOX does not scale. So TOX no longer scale. Second, the doping density cannot increase forever. So we have the assumption that the NA and D needs to increase by X. But the NA and ND, if you increase that, then the threshold voltage, if you recall, will increase. This is undesired because we need to scale down the threshold voltage actually according to the scaling rule. We need to scale down the voltage ideally. And also the doping density cannot increase to very high. We already talked about the uh, like the practical range of the doping density in the channel is up to 5 times five times 10 to the power 18. You cannot increase too many much beyond that because the if you have the doping density 
too much, then the silicon crystal structure cannot be maintained. So basically, the dopant cannot be treated as the impurity to the silicon. So 10 to power 9, if you recall the atomic density of the silicon, as you calculated in your homework, is about like 10 to power 22. So 1% uh, of that is 10 to power 19. 1% means 1 out of 100 silicon atom is replaced by the dopant. Then that is a limit where the silicon crystal can be still regarded as silicon. If you replace more than that, then the silicon is no longer silicon. So you have so many impurities. And also you cannot uh, increase the density beyond the atomic density level. Uh, even you replace all the silicon with the, your phosphorus, then you can only reach to 10 to power 22. You cannot increase more than that. So the doping density cannot increase further. And then the VDD cannot reduce forever. This is because the threshold volume cannot scale. VT can not scale. Why is that? If you recall the lecture 10, when we talk about the sub-threshold, and you have that in your homework as well. So if you recall this log ID versus VGS, we have this sub-threshold slope. And we say the sub-threshold slope will be larger than 60 millivolt per decade. This is due to the physics. Then if you want to maintain the on-off ratio, current on state versus off state, 10 to the power 5. Then the VTH is to be larger than 300 millivolts. Oops. So this is true in, even for today's like 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer process. Your VTH is roughly 300 millivolts. So you cannot scale that further. Then otherwise, the transistor no longer switch on and off. So those are the factors that cannot be scaled. That's why we have the challenges for scaling. We discussed earlier, the more snow is snowing down or the more snow is uh, uh, coming to an end. So those are the challenges that the industries are facing to scale the technology further. Any questions? But if we look back from the his historic perspective, the CMOS technology has gone through the mixed steps of the constant voltage and constant field scaling. It was uh, okay in the past few decades, but it will become more and more challenging in the years ahead. Um, if we cannot keep the constant field scaling, if we have the constant voltage scaling, or in the general scaling rule, you see that the power density goes up. That is uh, in this table. If the alpha is not 1, alpha equals to 1 is a constant uh, uh, field. But if alpha is not 1 in the general scaling or in the uh, constant voltage scaling, then the power density will go up. And that is true uh, in the past uh, few decades. Then the power density indeed has gone up. So this is what you have seen from the lecture one when we introduce the this uh, 3030. And we show this CPU power density, that is a watt, divided by the area of the chip in centimeter square. 
and this is a historical trend. So the power density indeed increases over the past few decades because of the general uh, scaling rule. If the alpha is larger than one, then the power density goes up. But in the recent years, the power density uh, saturated, and we discussed why uh, at the very beginning of the semester, and you have the homework on that. So this is uh, not because it's a uh, scaling rule. This is because of the frequency. So the power density is so high, as we discussed, the chip becomes very hot, then the reliability of the chip will become poor. Then you cannot uh, keep increasing the power density. And you know the power, active power, is proportional to the clock frequency, like CVDD squared times F. So we have to limit the F. So here the clock frequency after 2005, almost saturated. So if we limit the clock frequency, then the power density will be saturated. So the clock frequency nowadays are running not at the maximum clock frequency theoretically you can achieve. It's running intentionally lower than the theoretical limit to limit the power density. Because according to the scaling, the no matter uh, constant voltage or constant field, the circuit delay will always become smaller. Or in other words, theoretically you can always run the circuit faster. But here we intentionally run the circuit at this certain clock frequency. We no longer try to push the clock frequency. Even though in principle you can increase the clock frequency, but uh, intentionally we limit the clock frequency just for limiting the power density. So this is what we have discussed before. So any questions? All right, so this is uh, the end of uh, the lecture and uh, the key points uh, of today's lecture are actually all summarized in those tables here, especially this generalized scaling. You can apply it to any special case. And then we care about the circuit delay, we care about the power density. All right, if no more questions, we will stop here. Thank you.